This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. If you're listening today, I will assume that you have listened to my previous episode. Because today, I am continuing on with the murder case of Michelle Moore Bosco. It's a case that has been infamously referred to as the Norfolk Four, but not because there were four killers, but because of how the men's false confessions were obtained. Yeah, I know. I will get into that today. If you haven't already listened, I suggest that you pause, listen to part one first, and then return for the conclusion. Also, if you're a longtime listener, you already know my pronunciation sucks. Well, guess what? Last week, I referred to one of the suspects as Geoff because his name was spelled G-E-O-F-F. But guess what? Silly me, it's actually pronounced Jeff. Of course, my listeners take every opportunity to correct me. And sadly, most of you will reach out to me and say, I love your podcast, but just FYI, you pronounced this wrong. And listen, I really don't mind the correction, but if you love this show, leave a review. And maybe after you leave a review, you can reach out to me and tell me how much you love this show and also how I said something wrong. I mean, you know, if you told me you loved me 10 times and then told me about a screw up once or twice or 10 times per episode, I would definitely still feel the love. Also, last time, or I think on multiple occasions, I have mispronounced the USS Sipen. I usually refer to it as the USS Sapin. So there you go. The Navy, I'm always screwing up with their pronunciations and ranks and all that. Anyhow, I know I screw up a lot of words, but listen, I am human. Okay, with those screw ups out of the way for now, let's get into today's episode. Join me today as I bring you the conclusion of the murder of Michelle Moore Bosco. Now, let's dig in. At the end of part one, we discussed the seven suspects in the murder of 18-year-old Michelle Moore Bosco. We also learned about their evolving confessions that were obtained after they were subjected to hours and hours of interrogation by Detective Glenn Ford of the Norfolk Police Department. Daniel Williams had lived in the same apartment complex across the hallway from Michelle and her husband, Billy. Daniel had gone down to the station under good faith that he was providing them with what little information he had about Michelle's murder. After passing a polygraph but being told that he had failed, and after hours and days of interrogation, Daniel confessed and was ultimately charged with rape and murder. When Daniel's DNA was not a match to the DNA at the crime scene, the detectives turned their attention to Daniel's roommate, another sailor named Joe Dick. Despite a rock-solid alibi and passing a polygraph but being told he had failed, Joe was also interrogated for hours until he provided a confession as well. Joe, suspect number two, was also charged with rape and murder. When Joe's DNA was not a match, investigators dredged up another name, Eric Wilson. Eric went through the same thing as Daniel and Joe. He confessed, but there was no DNA match for him either. Yet he was also held without bail for rape and murder. That would make Eric Wilson suspect number three. Derek Tice was the next person to get roped into confessing. After 20 hours of an interrogation and a confession, Derek Tice was charged with rape and murder, making Derek suspect number four. After his interrogation, Derek provided two more names to detectives, 
Jeff Ferris and Richard Polly. Jeff and Richard refused to confess despite Detective Ford's best efforts. Even with their strong alibis and lack of confession, Jeff and Richard were also charged with Michelle's rape and murder. Jeff would be suspect number five, and Richard would be suspect number six. But the new charges against Derek, Jeff, and Richard were not backed up by the crime scene DNA. So detectives kept up their relentless interrogations and pressure for the men to provide more names. Derek finally caved and provided the name John Dancer. John was brought in and interrogated. He also had a rock-solid alibi and passed a polygraph. But it didn't matter. He was charged with rape and murder as well, making John Dancer suspect number seven. So here we have seven men, a mixture of Navy and Army active duty and veterans, all being held on false pretenses with no evidence of their connection to a murder besides their confessions. They all denied allegations for hours on end, but after being fed crime scene information and being bullied into thinking that they should confess or face the death penalty, they confessed, even though they passed polygraphs. Oh, and let's not forget that their DNA was not a match to the DNA found at Michelle's apartment. Yes, here they were, all sitting in jail, awaiting trial. And the prosecution's theory all along was that all of the men charged had gang-raped Michelle, then passed a knife around and took turns stabbing her. This theory, however, went against the physical evidence. You see, the evidence at the scene and the evidence obtained from Michelle's autopsy indicated that there was only one person responsible for this crime. But the investigators didn't care. There was no forced entry into the Bosco's apartment, no sign that seven men forced their way in and then dragged Michelle, fighting them, by the way, to the bedroom. None of the furniture was disturbed. And remember, when Billy arrived back from his cruise, the apartment was neat and tidy. The wood floors were polished and shiny. There were no drag marks or signs that there had been a struggle. Items on the shelves and counters like knickknacks and papers were undisturbed. And in the bedroom, the furniture wasn't even moved. Now, for a second, I want you to imagine this. Imagine seven military men in a small one-bedroom apartment flailing their hands, dropping their pants, and swinging a knife. I mean, of all the military men that I've ever met, I haven't met many that make small movements. In fact, I have four brothers, and when they walk into a room, yeah, they basically disturb all the furniture. And knickknacks, forget about it. Well, Michelle's body told a much different story than what the men's confessions indicated anyway. She had been stabbed three times. Listen, if seven dudes passed a knife around and each of them took a turn, there would be more than just three wounds. And the blood evidence at the crime scene was pulled around Michelle's body, not smeared all over the room because seven people were there too. The bedroom was tiny. It would have been impossible for it to not have been disturbed with so many people inside of it. The suspect DNA recovered at the crime scene had been collected from inside of Michelle's body under her fingernails, and on a blanket near her body. And did I mention that all of the DNA was from the same exact person? None of the suspects were a match to the sample. Most of them had alibis, and all of them had been coerced into confessing by Norfolk detective Glenn Ford. So let me go back a little bit to the end of part one, where we had also learned that in February of 1999, a woman brought a letter to authorities that Omar Ballard had written from prison. In the letter, Omar threatened to kill Karen, who received the letter, unless she sent him money and explicit pictures of herself. In the letter, Omar confessed to killing Michelle, saying, quote, remember that night I went to mommy's house and the next morning Michelle got killed? Guess who did that? Me. Ha ha. It wasn't the first time. If I was out, I would have killed that b down the street from you too, end quote. What? 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 So who is or was this Omar character? Billy and Michelle Bosco knew Omar through Michelle's best friend, Tamika. When Tamika would sleep over at the Bosco's, Omar would come by early the next morning to pick up Tamika. And on June 27, 1997, the Bosco's had given Omar refuge from an angry mob in their apartment complex. You see, the mob outside believed that Omar had hit a woman who lived at the complex. But the Boscos believed Omar when he said he hadn't done such thing and they stood up for him. 
Michelle and Billy allowed Omar to stay inside their apartment until the police arrived to sort things out. Two weeks after he had hid out in their apartment, Omar pled guilty to assaulting the woman at the apartment and was banished from the complex. The only thing was that Omar wasn't so good at following directions. Just 10 days after Michelle's murder, Omar was arrested after going back to the same apartment complex, then stalking, attacking, and raping a 14-year-old girl. The attack on the 14-year-old was the reason that he was now in prison. He had received a 41-year sentence for that horrible crime. After reading the letter from Omar, detectives looking into Michelle's case looked into Omar's letter. Detectives Glenn Ford and David Peterson went to the Augusta Correctional Center in Craigsville, Virginia. That was where Omar was serving his time. They asked him about Billy and Michelle standing up for him when he was being chased by the mob, and Omar verified that they did help him. The detectives then transported Omar back to Norfolk, and on March 11, 1999, while casually munching on some peanut M&Ms and drinking a Coke, Omar Abdul Ballard provided a full confession for the rape and murder of Michelle Moore Bosco. He told detectives that he had raped Michelle and then stabbed her to death. Detective Ford asked him about the knife he used, and Omar described the knife that was found at the crime scene to a T, something that the other seven suspects hadn't and couldn't do. Omar told detectives that he had gotten the knife from the kitchen, then described it. He said the blade had ridges. It was about four to five inches long and had a brown handle. The blade on the knife at the scene matched that exact description and had even been bent at a 90 degree angle from the force of stabbing Michelle. When Detective Ford asked Omar why he had gone back to the apartment and attacked Michelle after they had shown him such kindness, he simply replied, quote, I don't know, I just snapped, it is blank, end quote. Omar shocked the detectives by saying he acted alone. He told them that no one else was there when he attacked Michelle. And the DNA found at the scene told the same exact story. The single source of DNA evidence recovered at the scene was an exact match for Omar Ballard. No other DNA was located at the crime scene. Omar was then charged with rape and murder, making him suspect number eight. But regardless of this new exculpatory evidence for the seven men initially charged with Michelle's murder, their charges would not be dropped. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Omar's confession and subsequent charges caused a ripple effect with the seven defendants who had been charged with Michelle's murder. After their multiple confessions, Derek Tice and Joe Dick had agreed to testify against the other defendants, and that was all part of their plea deals. But listen, after hearing about Omar's confession and the DNA match, Derek changed his mind and demanded a trial instead. To avoid the death penalty, Daniel Williams, who you might recall was the neighbor and suspect number one, had already accepted a plea deal, so it was a little bit too late for him. He tried to withdraw his guilty plea, but a judge refused to let him go. Joe Dick and Daniel Williams each received two life sentences. Okay, that's suspect number one and suspect number two, now with convictions. As part of Joe's trial, he had agreed to testify against Richard Pauley, Jeff Ferris, and John Dancer. However, since Joe Dick had told so many conflicting versions of what happened, 
prosecutors knew that he wasn't going to be the best witness. And with that, the DA decided to drop all of the charges against Richard Pauley, Jeff Ferris, and John Dancer. So what about Eric and Derek? Well, prosecutors tried to reassure Billy Bosco, who was the husband, that everything was going to be okay and that they were still going to get a conviction on Eric Wilson, Derek Tice, and of course, Omar Ballard. By this point, Eric had signed a confession but tried to retract it after Omar said that he was the sole killer. But without the ability to retract the confession, his case would go to trial. In June of 1999, nearly two years after Michelle's murder, Eric Wilson's trial began. Eric's parents and brother traveled to Virginia from Texas to support him at trial. The prosecution settled on the following theory at Eric's trial. They said that all eight men rushed Michelle's front door. Once inside, they struggled with Michelle in the living and dining room areas. They forced her down the hallway to the bedroom, and once in there, they took turns raping and stabbing her. The prosecution said that while all the defendant's stories were inconsistent, they were all consistent, quote, at their core. They said that guilty people often lie or change their stories before they tell the truth. Doubling down, they said that lack of DNA doesn't prove that the defendant wasn't at the scene. The defense, on the other hand, well, they highlighted the fact that Omar Ballard's DNA was a match to the DNA at the crime scene and that Eric's DNA was not found there either. When Eric took the stand in his own defense, he denied having anything to do with Michelle's rape and murder. The prosecutor, Valerie Bowen, pressed, quote, Are you telling this jury that even though you weren't subjected to any kind of physical torture, you would have confessed to killing somebody, to taking somebody's life, end quote? Eric answered that he made up his confession because of Detective Ford aggressively harassing him. He told the prosecutor on cross, quote, Ma'am, at this point in time, if they had told me that I killed JFK, I would have told them I handed Oswald the gun, end quote. Continuing, Eric said that Detective Ford was, quote, very aggressive, very threatening, very angry. I thought I better tell him what he wanted to hear. He started hitting me in the forehead with his finger, end quote. Despite the evidence or lack of evidence presented during his trial, Eric Wilson was convicted of Michelle's rape on June 21st, 1999. However, the jury split the decision and found him not guilty of murder. During his victim impact statements leading up to sentencing, Billy told the jury about his and Michelle's life plans, stating, quote, Every step I took, we took together. We had so many plans. And you look at our apartment, we don't have a whole lot, but we are proud of what we had because we both worked to get it, end quote. Carol Moore, Michelle's mom, talked about Michelle being her firstborn, how Michelle was raised a sheltered life and how her death had affected the entire family. Carol had tried to shield Michelle's younger brothers about the truth of how she died, telling them that Michelle had died in a car accident. Carol stated, quote, my two boys, I can't even give my whole self to them. It's not fair, end quote. On September 8th, 1999, after deliberating for only an hour, the jury sentenced Eric to eight and a half years in prison. After hearing this, Billy Bosco lost it in court, exclaiming, what the hell was this jury thinking? He demanded an audience with the judge, Circuit Judge Charles E. Poston. Once in chambers, Billy asked Judge Poston, quote, eight guys arrested for the murder of my wife. Three of them are walking free right now, and this one gets eight and a half years. Is this justice? End quote. On February 8th, 2000, Derek Tice's trial began. It was moved to Arlington, Virginia because of the extensive publicity of the case in Norfolk. Charles E. Poston was the presiding judge. He was the same judge who had presided over Eric Wilson's trial. In Arlington, the prosecutor D.J. Hansen, who was a former Navy drag, by the way, described for the jury why Michelle's murder had gotten so much attention in Norfolk. He explained that Norfolk is a Navy town, quote, when the fleet comes in, it's a huge event. You have all of the kids down there on the pier. Daddy's home. Big celebration. There is a military family that cares for these people when their wives and their husbands and their parents are gone. There is a saying in Norfolk that Navy takes care of its own. And one of the things that makes this crime so outrageous and so vile, ladies and gentlemen, 
is that these men were sailors and they did this to another sailor's wife, end quote. The prosecution followed the same playbook as they did with Eric Wilson's trial, using the confessions as their basis or their anchor for the case against Derek. The defense's request to bring in an expert witness on false confessions was denied, but they were allowed to question Detective Ford about his interrogation techniques. Joe Dick was the star witness at the trial. This time, he testified that all of his previous statements were false. He said that he, Daniel Williams, Derek Tice, Richard Polly, Jeff Ferris, and John Dancer were all involved. What the hell is going on here, huh? Anyway, Joe said they were all involved, but they didn't plan the murder. In this version of his story, Joe testified that Daniel Williams wanted to see what color underwear Michelle was wearing. Joe said they went over, knocked, but she said go away. Then they went to the parking lot and Omar Ballard showed up. All eight men went to Michelle's apartment, covered the peephole, knocked, and Michelle opened the door a crack. They pushed the door in. Joe testified that Michelle was wearing a white shirt when she came to the door. But Joe said he didn't remember if she was wearing it when they attacked her. They took her to the bedroom and all took turns raping her. Daniel Williams raped her first and Joe was last. He said Omar Ballard may have grabbed her neck. They used a five-inch steak knife to stab her and that was a knife that someone had grabbed from the kitchen. By this point, Eric Wilson was gone and Joe was the last to stab her. Now, it's unclear to me at this point if the seven original suspects even know Omar Ballard because he has no military connection that I can find. Well, guess what? Omar Ballard testified at Derek's trial. Can I just pause and say how confusing it is that Eric and Derek had fully litigated trials? I mean, their names sound the same. And can this case get any more confusing? Omar Ballard himself was put on the stands, but he denied any involvement. The judge would not allow Omar's two confessions to be introduced at Derek's trial. And the defense was not allowed to question Omar about the letter that he sent or his past crimes against women like the attack on the 14-year-old at the very apartment complex where Michelle was murdered. What in the hell is going on in Virginia right now? Why would Omar's confession not be introduced at Derek's trial? I mean, it's exculpatory evidence. After his outburst at Eric's trial, Billy was in attendance for Derek's trial, but he left before the verdict was announced. On February 11, 2000, Derek Tice was found guilty of capital murder and rape, and on June 7, he was sentenced to two life sentences. At that point in time, Billy Bosco returned to Pittsburgh and didn't return to Norfolk to attend any of the future court hearings. On March 15, 2000, authorities met with Omar Ballard, who was still claiming to have acted alone in the murder. But the prosecution needed him to support their theory that eight people were involved in Michelle's case. They told Omar that they'd drop the death penalty if he changed his story and implicated the other seven men. Faced with death, Omar accepted the deal, and on March 22nd, Omar Ballard pled guilty and was sentenced to two life terms by Judge Poston. Omar gave a, quote, very short statement describing the crime based on what Detective Ford implied had occurred, end quote. The following comes from Detective Ford's notes in reference to the interview when Omar Ballard gave his final statement. Detective Ford's notes say that he, Omar, Daniel Williams, Joe Dick, Eric Wilson, and Derek Tice met up in the apartment parking lot. They started talking about trying to get into Michelle's apartment, and the four sailors told Omar they had tried to get into her apartment, but she wouldn't let them in. Omar said that he would get them in because he was friends with her. They all walked up to the apartment, and Omar knocked while the four others stood to the side. When Michelle opened the door, they all rushed in. They took her into the bedroom where they all raped and stabbed her. Omar said he was the last one to leave the apartment, saying this was the truth and that, quote, the others never told on him because he told them that he would come back and get them, end quote. He hadn't told this story to police before because he was already in prison and a member of the 5%, which, by the way, is the name of a prison gang, 
and that Omar didn't want anyone to know that he had been involved in a crime with, quote, white boys. In his notes, Detective Ford mentioned that Omar was given a polygraph, which he did not pass, then was sent back to jail. It should be noted that Omar Ballard has never implicated any other person in the crime outside of this plea deal. So, just to bring you up to speed, if you lost count, this case is infamously known as the Norfolk Four because four of the original seven suspects were convicted in connection with Michelle's case, not counting Omar, who, if you haven't figured it out by now, was the real and only criminal in this case. Eric Wilson was convicted of rape and he was acquitted of murder. And Daniel Williams, Joe Dick and Derek Tice were convicted of rape and murder. Hence the name, the Norfolk Four. So let me get into the court appeals. On July 25th, 2000, Daniel Williams appealed his sentence with the Virginia Court of Appeals. In the appeal, he stated that he wanted to change his guilty plea at sentencing, but the judge ruled that Daniel had entered his plea knowingly and voluntarily. Daniel's appeal was denied. Derek Tice, however, had more success at the appellate level. His attorney argued that Derek's defense team should have been allowed to question Omar about his confession letter and that the trial judge incorrectly excluded that evidence. On May 21st, 2002, Derek Tice's conviction was reversed and a new trial was ordered. About a month before Derek's retrial, Detective Ford and another detective visited Omar. Omar said that he was going to testify truthfully, and Detective Ford said Omar needed to testify that he had nothing to say. Due to Omar's need to tell the truth, somehow both the prosecution and defense convinced Omar not to take the stand, which what? Why would Derek's defense not want Omar to take the stand and tell the truth? The day before the retrial, Derek's attorney visited Omar and said they didn't want him to say anything on the stand. Omar later said in an affidavit that Derek's attorneys knew he was going to testify that Derek was innocent. Also, on the day before the retrial, prosecutors visited Omar and encouraged him to testify that he had, quote, nothing to say, end quote. On January 27, 2003, Derek's retrial began in Alexandria, Virginia. He faced the same judge again, Judge Charles E. Poston, as well as the same prosecutor, D.J. Hansen. The prosecution told jurors, quote, people just do not confess to something of this magnitude, this heinous, this vicious, without having participated in it. It's just not natural. It's just not reasonable, end quote. Then the prosecutor played Derek Tice's 18-minute confession tape and said, quote, just listen to his tone of voice. Does that sound like someone who is being pressured into making a statement, end quote? The defense attempted to have Omar Ballard's confession and statements that were made prior to his trial entered as evidence, but Judge Poston denied the request. He also denied their request to read Omar Ballard's jailhouse confession letter to Karen in court. And listen, because Omar felt pressured and threatened by all the attorneys in this courtroom, Omar pled the fifth when he took the stand and didn't say anything. The jury never heard about Detective Ford's history of eliciting false confessions because the judge ruled it was inadmissible. In fact, the judge said that whether Detective Ford, quote, obtained a false confession or not seems to me to be relatively benign because I suspect that many police officers have done that because we have all seen people who confess to anything, end quote. On January 31st, 2003, Derek Tice was convicted of capital murder and rape and was immediately sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. In 2004, the Innocence Project got involved after there had been some publicity about the case. They were able to secure three large D.C.-based law firms who agreed to work on the case pro bono. Pretty quickly, the attorneys found no indication that police even searched Daniel Williams' apartment for evidence. You might recall he was suspect number one. In March of 2005, Omar Ballard signed a sworn affidavit stating that he raped and killed Michelle on his own. He said, quote, none of the other individuals who were charged with raping or killing Michelle were there or involved in any way. 
they are all innocent, and the ones who are in prison are serving long sentences for crimes they did not commit, end quote. The Innocence Project attorneys hired Academy Group, Inc., a forensic consulting firm to put together a crime scene reconstruction report. On November 3, 2005, they released a 60-page report with tons of findings supporting that the now known as Norfolk Four, which are Daniel Williams, Joe Dick, Eric Wilson, and Derek Tice, were wrongfully convicted of raping and murdering Michelle Moore Bosco. And the report goes on to say the following, quote, Mrs. Michelle Moore Bosco was sexually assaulted and murdered by Omar Ballard on July 8, 1997, in her Norfolk, Virginia apartment. Ballard was alone with Moore Bosco when he killed her. He confessed to this homicide and solely his DNA was found under her fingernails and in her vagina. Statements made by Ballard to police investigators were consistent with the physical evidence found at the crime scene and found during the victim's autopsy. There was no evidence of any nature linking Williams, Dick, Wilson, or Tice to this crime. Statements they made were not consistent with the physical evidence with the victim's wounds or behavioral evidence. They had nothing to do with this matter and were charged only because they confessed to the crimes. Why the evidence does not support this as a multiple offense crime. First, if eight healthy young men were in a tiny, approximately 700 square foot apartment taking turns restraining and sexually assaulting a kicking and violently fighting female, It can be presumed that their rigorous activity, anxiety, nervousness, and testosterone would lead to a far greater amount of physical, biological, and behavioral evidence being present that was found at the time. Two, the greater the number of people present, the greater the chance for leaving fingerprints, hairs, fibers, footwear impressions, and semen, and the greater chance of breaking, stealing, or disturbing something in the small apartment. There was not enough physical evidence present to support this as being a multiple offender crime. Physical evidence. If this were a multiple offender crime, one would expect more fingerprints throughout the apartment, more fingerprints on the polished surface of bedroom floor, footwear impressions on the polished floor, more sign of a struggle or fight, more debris tracked in by offenders, more hair and fibers, greater disturbance to the apartment, damage to the apartment, more theft, a mixture of different semen and DNA. Also, furniture would have been moved. One of the dining chairs had been pulled out and was partially blocking the hallway. The report stated, quote, multiple offenders moving with Michelle to the bedroom would have to navigate through a very narrow one foot four inch gap between the dining chair and the hallway wall, end quote. That chair would have been knocked over. With regards to wounds, if more than one person was involved, Michelle would have sustained more injuries. Fighting off eight men would have left behind restraint injuries. There would have been more than one person's DNA under her fingernails. If multiple people stabbed Michelle, there would be a, quote, greater variation in wound location, direction, size, and depth, end quote. Behavioral evidence. Eight people gang raping a woman in an apartment would have made a lot of noise someone would have noticed a group of eight men around the complex. All right. In September of 2005, Eric Wilson was released from prison after completing his sentence. You might recall that he was acquitted of murder and only sentenced for rape. The condition of his release included the requirement for him to register as a sex offender for the remainder of his life. Eric had a hard time on the outside. He had to hire an attorney and pay $10,000 to convince the electrician's board to grant him a license. Because of his sex offender status, he couldn't work on certain properties like schools or parks, and he and his wife searched for places to live, but he had to own up to the fact that he was a registered sex offender. And the community had the power to deny this couple's application, and it kept happening over and over again, forcing them to live in a rural area with no neighbors. On November 10th, 2005, the Innocence Project attorneys filed petitions for executive clemency and paroles with then-Virginia Governor Mark Warner. Eric Wilson filed a separate petition since he was no longer imprisoned. After the petitions were filed, the prosecutor, D.J. Hansen, told the media that there is, quote, no new evidence of innocence, quote, there are no unanswered questions, end quote. He said the Norfolk Four's claims were nothing more than sound bites invented by, quote, hired gun experts, which he referred to as the Clemency Gang. Governor Warner didn't make a decision on the clemency petitions, so the Innocence Project attorneys kept working. 
They tracked down Joe Dick's supervisor from the time of the murder, Senior Chief Michael Ziegler. He was a highly decorated veteran who'd been in the Navy more than 20 years. The attorney spoke with Ziegler, who said that he is absolutely certain that Joe was on duty the night of the murder. Unequivocally, there was no way that he could have been involved. Senior Chief Ziegler said that Joe Dick was the type of sailor who needed a lot of supervision, so Ziegler would check on him multiple times per shift. In 2006, Senior Chief Ziegler testified under oath that a few months after the murder, Joe Dick was talking to him about how Daniel Williams had been arrested. Joe talked about how Daniel was innocent and how detectives were now asking him, meaning Joe, where he was the night of the murder. The senior chief asked him, well, where were you that night? And Joe said he was on watch. Senior Chief Ziegler said that would be easy enough to prove. So they went and looked at the schedule. And Joe was right. He'd been on duty for 24 hours that day. Senior Chief Ziegler said that when he found out that Joe had been arrested, he went to his commanding officer and said he knew Joe was working the day of the murder and that he had nothing to do with it. Michael Ziegler also said he was worried that Joe would make a false confession. Get this, he was told that the Navy would look into it. A few days later, Senior Chief Ziegler was told that Joe had made a confession and was pleading guilty. But there was nothing the Navy could do. They said that Senior Chief Ziegler should be ready to answer any questions police had for him. But guess what? No one ever called him to speak to him. And this really baffled him. Senior Chief Michael Ziegler told the New York Times that there's no way Joe snuck off the ship, committed the crime, then snuck back on board. He said, quote, the Joseph Dick I knew couldn't chew bubblegum and tie shoes at the same time. There's no way in hell anyone can convince me Joseph Dick could pull that off, end quote. Now, can I just stop for a minute and say, while nothing about this story is funny, it is a little bit comical thinking of someone not being able to chew gum and tie their shoes at the same time and still be a member of the military. But hey, I've been around long enough to know that I spy no lies in that statement. Anyway, in 2006, Omar Ballard testified under oath that he alone killed Michelle Moore Bosco. No one else helped him. The Innocence Project attorneys obtained expert opinions on the unlikelihood that the Norfolk Four were involved in Michelle's murder. The result was as follows. Two forensic pathologists found that it was virtually impossible for more than one person to have murdered Michelle. They said the prosecutor's theory was extremely implausible. There was an expert in DNA analysis, and that person found that the absence of DNA evidence connecting the Norfolk Four to the murder made it, quote, overwhelmingly likely, end quote, that the Norfolk Four were not involved. Law enforcement experts, including a former FBI agent, found that Omar Ballard acted alone and again that the Norfolk Four were not involved. A false confessions expert found that the Norfolk Four's confessions were completely false. Yeah, okay. The expert's conclusion was based on multiple reasons, but the main two were, one, the confessions were completely inconsistent with the crime scene and with each other, and two, the Norfolk Four were threatened with the death penalty if they didn't confess. More than 20 members of the Richmond chapter of the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI examined the case file independently, and they concluded that the Norfolk Four were innocent. The pro bono attorneys then contacted jurors from Eric Wilson and Derek Tice's trials and showed them evidence that hadn't been shown at trial. First, they were shown Omar Ballard's sworn testimony that he was the sole perpetrator of the crime, and they also showed them the chilling letter in which he admitted that he killed Michelle. Second, they told jurors about Omar's crime spree against women at the time he murdered Michelle, including his physical assault of a woman in the apartment complex two weeks earlier, and the rape and attempted strangulation of a 14-year-old girl 10 days after Michelle's murder. Third, they told the jurors Detective Ford's history in eliciting false confessions together with expert testimony on how the coercive interrogation tactics resulted in inconsistent statements which bear the hallmarks of false confessions. Fourth, the jury was shown Joe Dick's alibi confirming that he was on duty on the USS Saipan at the time of the crime and expert testimony from a crime scene reconstruction analyst and a forensic pathologist stating this was a single perpetrator crime committed by no one else but Omar Ballard. After reviewing the evidence, 10 jurors wrote a joint letter saying that they would have acquitted 
if they had this evidence at trial. On November 27, 2006, the Virginia Circuit Court overturned Derek Tice's second conviction due to ineffective counsel. The state appealed the Circuit Court's decision to the Virginia Supreme Court, who then reinstated Derek's conviction. On August 6, 2009, then Virginia Governor Timothy Kane granted Daniel Williams, who was 37, Derek Tice, who was 39, and Joe Dick, who was 33, conditional pardons. The governor did not declare their innocence, however, instead just reduced their sentence to time served. Governor Kane said the men, quote, have not conclusively established their innocence and therefore that an absolute pardon is not appropriate, end quote. What? They're either guilty or not. That's very weird. When Daniel, Eric, and Joe were released, the three men were put on parole for 20 years. And just like Eric Wilson, after his release, they all had to register as convicted sex offenders and violent offenders. On September 14, 2009, a U.S. district judge overturned Derek Tice's conviction based on ineffective counsel. The defense apparently should have moved to suppress his confession since Derek Tice said he wanted an attorney when he was originally interrogated by Norfolk police. So if you're keeping track, that means that one of the Norfolk four no longer had a felony record, Derek Tice. He was free-ish 12 years after the murder. In March of 2010, Eric Wilson petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus. The U.S. District Court denied the petition since Eric was no longer in custody. He continued to be denied when he filed appeals for his conviction. Now, let me talk about Detective Ford. Get this. On October 27, 2010, former Detective Glenn Ford was convicted by a U.S. District Court on two counts of extortion and one count of making false statements to the FBI. And this was all unrelated to the Norfolk Four case. It turned out that our boy Ford, going all the way back to the 90s, had been taking bribes from criminals and in exchange, he helped them get released on bond or helped reduce their sentences by lying to prosecutors and judges that they had helped with the investigation. When questioned by the FBI, Ford lied about it. In February of 2011, 57-year-old Glenn Ford was sentenced to almost the maximum time allowed, 12 and a half years in prison. Crazy, right? Okay. After this sentence, U.S. Attorney Neil McBridge said, quote, It is a sad day when somebody called upon to enforce the law betrays that trust and betrays not just his fellow cops, but the court system, the public, and the law he took an oath to uphold, end quote. On August 4th, prosecutors announced that they were dismissing charges against Derek Tice. He was officially exonerated. If you're tracking, Derek Tice was the second member of the Norfolk Four to no longer live under a felony conviction. Five more years would go by until September 26, 2016, when U.S. District Judge John Gibney said no sane human being would have convicted Daniel Williams and Joe Dick. He said the state had 60 days to retry them, and if they didn't, the men would be exonerated. Then the Virginia Attorney General Mark Herring, quote, conceded errors in the initial investigation and withdrew his office's longstanding opposition to their claims of innocence, end quote. The state withdrew all charges, and on October 26, 2016, Daniel Williams and Joe Dick were finally exonerated. So that's number three and number four of the Norfolk Four. That means that they no longer live with a conviction and it only took 19 years after Michelle's murder. In November of 2016, Attorney General Herring told the Norfolk police to video all interrogations and confessions relating to murders. And honestly, I am floored that it was in 2016 that they were told this. Like, what? Wouldn't they have been doing this already? According to the New York Times, the Norfolk Four's attorneys continued fighting for absolute pardons because they, quote, carried greater weight than court rulings and were essential to helping the men rebuild their lives and reputations, end quote. On March 21, 2017, then-Governor Terry McAuliffe granted absolute pardons to the Norfolk Four. Their names were finally removed from the sex offender and felony offender registries. 
A spokesman for the governor's office, Brian Coy, said, quote, These pardons close the final chapter on a grave injustice that has plagued these four men for nearly 20 years. While former Governor Kane had initially granted conditional pardons in the case, more exculpatory information discovered since then and detailed by U.S. District Judge John Gibney during exhaustive evidentiary proceedings indicate that absolute pardons are appropriate, end quote. Eric Wilson made a press release that said, quote, I speak for all four of us in expressing our deepest thanks to Governor McAuliffe, who has given us our lives back with these full pardons. We have been haunted by these wrongful convictions for 20 years, which have created profound pain, hardships, and stress for each of us and our families. We now look forward to rebuilding our reputations and our lives, end quote. Not everyone, though, was a fan of their full pardons. Michelle's mom, Carol Moore, said, quote, It's hard to believe that hearing the confessions and knowing the details of this case, these men were not involved with the murder of our daughter. The governor and the judicial system who work so hard to free these killers will have it on their conscience if any of them commit another violent crime, end quote. The following was written by one of the attorneys who helped free the Norfolk Four, quote, Social scientists and psychologists have noted that contemporary methods of psychological interrogation could lead innocent individuals to falsely confess to serious crimes. A report by leading psychologists Richard Leo and Richard J. Offshe shows that 15% of defendants who made undisputedly false confessions pled guilty despite their innocence to avoid the risk of the death penalty or some other harsh sentence. Research also shows that suspects who falsely confess also frequently implicate others in their efforts to appease their interrogators. Another study from the Innocence Project reviewed 140 wrongful convictions and found that 25% were the result of false confessions, end quote. The Norfolk Four filed a civil suit against the city of Norfolk and state of Virginia for their wrongful convictions. In December 2018, they all settled. The city paid the Norfolk Four $4.9 million, and the state paid them $3.5 million. I'm not sure I have ever heard of a false confession or a wrongful conviction case as crazy and involved as this one. Now, while these men were victims in their own right, before I end today's episode, I want to focus and remember the person whose life was taken. Michelle Moore Bosco was just 18 years old when Omar Ballard took her life. She was born on August 19, 1978 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to parents Jack and Carol Moore. Michelle's friends described her as sweet, quietly funny, and a little goofy. Michelle was the oldest of three and had two younger brothers that were 9 and 12 when she died. She loved country music, line dancing, and fishing with her dad. And of course, we know that she loved her husband, Billy Bosco. After graduating from high school in 96, Billy joined the Navy and requested to be stationed in Norfolk to be close to Pittsburgh. Billy and Michelle got married in secret on April 4th, 1997, when Michelle and her best friend took a weekend trip down to Norfolk. They had planned to have a big family wedding in October of 97. Michelle told her parents that she was moving to Norfolk to live with her best friend, Erin. But secretly, she had moved in with her new secret husband, Billy, instead. They made a little life together in their tiny apartment just outside of Norfolk Navy Base's Gate 4. At the time, Carol, Michelle's mom, didn't think that Michelle was ready to move out. She felt that her daughter was too young to live on her own because she had never even been away from home before. After leaving Pittsburgh and marrying Billy, Michelle called her mom every day. After her murder, Carol had to visit Michelle's grave every week instead of hearing her daughter's voice on a daily basis. Billy Bosco met his current wife, Amy, while working at an olive garden just after getting out of the Navy. He worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections and retired as a sergeant. According to his social media, he is, quote, an artist, a woodcarver, a pyrographer and painter. I'm a gentleman and a survivor, end quote. So, True Crime Army, how do you feel? This case is so very tragic on so many levels. And if you get a chance to watch that documentary I talked about, PBS Frontline called The Confessions, please do. It's all about Michelle's case, the Norfolk Four, and the injustice that robbed so many people of a full life. 
Shout out to Myrtle for writing this episode for me and shout out to her and Haley Gray for their research efforts and putting this very confusing case together. I want to thank all of my listeners, as always, for listening in another week. Don't forget to write in your tales from the trenches stories if you have a crazy crime story that either happened to you or close to home or even a spooky tale, make sure you write it in. A link is going to be in the show notes. At this point, my next Tales from the Trenches episode won't come out until probably like Halloween, but that will be here before we know it. My sources for this episode include a documentary on front lines called The Confessions, as well as articles in the Navy Times and various appellate court opinions, and that seven-part article on The Pilot Online. Military Murder was created by Mama Margot Productions. The music was created by Ty Ops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. working on our podcast. I don't want to.